Hi, we're in Galatians chapter 4, we're just going to look at a few verses, verses 4 through 7, which is really rich in doctrine. For those of you that are watching on the screen, you'll probably notice straight away that I've highlighted a few uh, words or names, and you can see the doctrine of the Trinity in these verses, particularly in verse 6. Um, but we'll take it from verse 4. So Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So we see two persons of the Trinity in verse 4. God sent forth his Son. And I'm not going to go too much into the Strong's Concordance or the Greek or anything in this video, but I think it is worth just having a look at the expression sent forth. So you'll see the expression here. This is probably the only word in the Greek that we'll look at today. It's G1821 in the concordance. It's the Greek word there, ex apostello. To send away forth, that is, on a mission, to dispatch, to send away forth and out. Now, the X is out of or from. And then you've got the word apostle here, apostello. So out from the apostle to send away forth, that is, on a mission. And this is really important because God sent forth his son, meaning that the son was always the son. He wasn't the, the word that became the son. He was the word manifest in the flesh, but he's always been the son. And it's interesting that there's a reference to the apostle and being on a mission. So Christ is that apostle, or if you like, God is the apostle. Christ comes from, out from, he comes out forth from God, from the triune Godhead. So we can see that this is out from Apostello, the Apostle, on a mission. And indeed, we'll see in Hebrews chapter 3 that Christ is the Apostle. We just go to Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the Apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now also, the disciples, before Jesus left this earth, he sent his disciples out into the world to preach the gospel to every creature. So he sent them out as apostles. But the disciples also were always apostles. If we have a look, we can go to pretty much any of the gospels. We'll go to Luke. Luke 6.13 says, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. And then Luke 6 goes on to name the apostles 
including Judas Iscariot of the Twelve, Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Okay, but it's important here that to see that the disciples were always apostles. They weren't disciples that then became apostles when Jesus sent them forth. And so we have the same thing here. God sent forth out, out of ex apostelos, out of the apostle, his son. God sent forth his son. So the son was eternally the son. He didn't become the son. Just like the apostles didn't change from one thing to another, from disciples to apostles. He always called them the apostles. And that Jesus was always the Son, even before he came as Jesus, manifest in the flesh. We will see in many other scriptures that God sent forth his Son. He didn't send forth the Word to become the Son. Um, we've got a number of scriptures that will tell us this. So Isaiah 48. Um, again, you'll see the Trinity in this scripture, verse 16 says, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. Thus saith the Lord, thy, re thy Redeemer, The Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Okay, so you can see here, again, two doctrines. The Trinity, Father, the Spirit, and the Son. And the Son here, the Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. That the Father and the Spirit have sent. So this is Jesus speaking, saying, from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I. It's the eternal sonship in this scripture also. In Zechariah chapter 2, staying with the Old Testament for a moment, from verse 8, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts have sent me unto thee. So clearly, you've got a very similar, if not the exact same thing, going on in Zechariah. In John 6, 38, Jesus speaking says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Again, this is the Son being sent by the Father. And this is the Father's will which have sent me, that all which he have given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And on, so on and so forth. In fact, verse 40 as well. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Father sends the Son. John 8, verse 42, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, ye you would love me, for I proceeded, I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he 
sent me. Staying in John, again Jesus talking, uh, John 10 verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world. So the Father does two things here. He sanctified and sent into the world. Thou blessed femeth, because I said, I am the Son of God. So this should be pretty clear by now that the Father sent the Son. He didn't send the Word, the word of God, although Jesus is the Word of God. He didn't send, send the Word to become the Son. The Word is the Son eternally. The Word of God eternally. The Son of God. Just one more scripture on this. In the first epistle of John. Uh, chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him herein is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins he sent his son. And in the same chapter, verse 14 says, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Now look at this. The Father sent the Son to be. So he's sending the Son He's the Son before he comes into the world. The Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. So when we see in Galatians 4.4 4, that God sent forth his Son, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is the eternal Son. He didn't become the Son on conception or on birth or at some point later he sent forth meaning he sent on a mission what was the mission here it is in verse 5 to redeem so God sent forth his son to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons so in verse 4, not only do we see the Father and the Son, the first and second persons of the triune Godhead, we also see eternal sonship and made of a woman, made under the law. I'm not going to go through a whole load of scripture on this, but not made of man. So there's another doctrine, in fact there's two other doctrines here going on. The virgin birth and also the doctrine of adoption because made under the law, meaning that Joseph who's not the natural father is the lawful father of Christ. So the virgin birth, the divine conception or immaculate conception as I think the Catholics would say, I don't know if that's a Catholic expression, but um, the divine immaculate conception of Christ made in the womb of the woman through the Holy Spirit and made under the law, meaning he was a legitimate son a lawful son, Joseph being his lawful father, not his natural father. But because he's his lawful father, Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. It's lawful, it's legitimate, it's legal. 
So he came to redeem them that were under the Lord, that we might re receive the adoption of sons. So here this would go back, uh, way, way back to uh, God calling his people out of Egypt at the time of the Hebrews being in Egypt and calling them out as Israelites to make a nation. I'm not going to put all the uh, scripture back from Exodus and Genesis and Exodus on the screen for you now. But um, Romans chapter 9 verse 4 reads, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So it pertains to the adoption. The previous chapter, Galatians 3 verse 26 reads, For ye are all the children of God by faith. By faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 12 reads, But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, his name being Jesus Christ. And of course there's many other scriptures. Plenty of scriptures in Romans. Uh, on the adoption of sons. So you'll see just in verses 4 and 5 there is a whole load of doctrine defined just in these verses. So let's move on to the next two verses 6 and 7. So the Galatians 4 verse 6 And because ye are sons God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So again, like I said previously, you've got all three persons of the triune Godhead here. The Father God, Abba, Father, the Spirit of God and the Son of God, all in one verse, quite clear and apparent to see three persons of the Godhead there. Um, it's quite interesting that God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now this is interesting because this is talking about the intercession that the Holy Spirit makes on behalf of the believer. We'll look at a few quick scriptures on that. So Romans 8 verses 26 and 27. Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth. What is the mind of the Spirit? Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 reads, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. I'm sorry, I'm not putting all these scriptures on the screen for you. But um, I'll put Ephesians chapter 6 on the screen for you though. Ephesians 6.18 reads, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the Gospel. So again, the Spirit speaking for us for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So speaking, by the will of the Father, through the Holy Spirit, he's making speech for us. Okay, so there's much, much more scripture 
on the Holy Spirit. And because ye are sons, God have sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit makes intercession for us. The Spirit speaks to the Father for us. We pray in the Spirit to the Father. And the Spirit shows us what to say, how to speak boldly. So this is very rich. These verses here are very rich in the understanding of God and the understanding of ourselves in God, in Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and verse 7, we'll just read this as a final verse today. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. An heir of God through Christ. So we'll have a look at that really quickly. Okay, so just going back to Galatians chapter 3, 26 again quickly, just to remind ourselves. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 29 at the end of the chapter states, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So if we're in Christ, if we are Christ's, belong to Christ by faith, then we are heirs according to the promise. And that's actually eternal security. There we're heirs according to the to the promise. If you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's eternal security. So we're looking at a lot of doctrine here that's all springing forth from these four verses in Galatians chapter 4. So we're no more a servant but a son. So this son is a permanent Again, this, this is amazing scripture because this son is, when you become a son, or when we become a son, we become eternal sons, just like Jesus is the eternal son. You see, when you become a son, you cannot lose your sonship. Yeah, and if, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, that's it, that's eternal security, and it's also the eternal sonship of Christ, all tied in, and the Trinity, and all these other doctrines, all tied in, in this very short passage. It's amazing scripture. Um, so, heirs of God, let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15, the first verse, talking about Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham, in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. This is Jesus Christ speaking. These are the words of Christ here, the eternal Son speaking to Abraham in Genesis 15, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield. We hear that again, we hear that so many times in the Psalms from David and others, saying, The Lord is my shield, my redeemer, my safe, my salvation. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Christ is the reward. He is the inheritance. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 18 very quickly. Deuteronomy 18, talking about the Levites here. So, verse 1, The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance. 
as he had said unto them, the Lord is their inheritance. Exactly the same thing we're seeing with Abraham in Genesis 15 and we're seeing with sons, believers, believers in Christ in Galatians chapter 4 and we also see this in Hebrews chapter <laughs> chapter 11 I had to think then so Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 now this is talking if we go on just from verse 5 it says that he pleased God so talking about pleasing God verse 6 says but without faith it is impossible to please him meaning God for he that cometh to God must believe that he is that he is what? that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him so he, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him so again this is talking about faith it's talking about faith in Christ. He that cometh to God, this is meaning Christ here, must believe that he is God. So those that are putting their faith, exercising their faith in the gospel, in the correct gospel, they must believe that Christ is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him and Christ is the reward as we see as we've just seen in the other scriptures I'll just read some other scripture quickly without putting it on the screen but for you here Psalm 16 verse 5 says the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup thou maintainest my lot thou maintainest my lot my everything thou maintainest it the Lord keeps us we don't keep Christ okay he keeps us we're eternally secure in him Lamentations chapter 3 verse 24 says something very similar it says the Lord is my portion saith my soul Therefore will I hope in him. So the Lord is my portion. My, my portion is my inheritance. Okay. Because we're heirs of God through Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 23 states. And ye are Christ's. And Christ is God's. Ye are Christ's. And Christ is God's. So as sons if a son then an heir of God through Christ of course uh, John chapter 14 let's go there quickly John 14 verse 6 says Jesus saith unto him I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me so then an heir of God through Christ no man cometh to the Father no man cometh to God but through Christ which is what Jesus said in his own words in John chapter 14 and just one more scripture on this because I don't want this to be too long and overrunning Revelation 21 Verse 6, Jesus talking again, and he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Freely. No service or payment required. Jesus did all the payments. Jesus did all the work. For our salvation. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Why? Because all things are in Christ. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. 
There we are. So I will leave that there for you. Um, again, just an amazing amount of scripture and uh, an amazing amount of doctrine and teaching for us in just these four very this very brief passage, four verses there. I mean there's so much more in this in this chapter, in this book, in the whole of the Bible obviously. But the word is rich. It's rich. It's rich in nourishment for us. And of course, so much doctrine in here. Verse 6, I would say, is a very good verse to remember if someone's coming against you regarding the Trinity, because you've got all three persons of the Trinity in there. Um, but hopefully what we've looked at briefly today um, will be a good place to start if you want to start explaining the eternal sonship, the Trinity, the inheritance, the adoption, etc. Okay, because we've got a, a very brief passage here in Galatians 4 that we can refer people to if maybe they don't have the understanding or if they're coming against us uh, on these doctrines. Anyway, I will leave that there. I hope that's been a blessing to you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.